Welcome back to lecture four on the series of concerning man and the origin of sin. And in this one, we're going to begin with a scripture which is very prominent in John chapter two, verses 13 through 22. I'll be reading out of the American Standard Version today. And so if you get your Bible, turn over to John two, verses 13 through 22. Let's look at that. And the pastor of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changes of money sitting, and made a scourge of cords and cast out all of the temple, both the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the changers' money and overthrew their tables. And to them that sold the doves he said, Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for thy house shall eat me, eat me up. The Jews therefore answered and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, saying that thou doest these things? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days will I raise it up. The Jews therefore said, Forty and six years is this temple in building, wilt thou raise it up in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he spoke this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. When the subject of Christianity is mentioned today in the media, we see really scorn and laughter and disdain for the principles that we believe in. Comments from the past relate directly to comments made today. For instance, this quote, an impression prevails that religion is good for dyspleptics and invalids, for nervous people and women, but that it does not sit well with the body full of spirit and health. In other words, it's kind of like a crux, kind of like um, what Marx used to say, that religion was the opiate of the masses. You see, who I am as a Christian, I consider to be the most fundamental, yet probably the most misunderstood doctrine in Christendom. Dependent upon the denomination that you belong to, you can be anything from a layman to a priest to clergy to a director of some type of ministry to an elder to a deacon to reverend to pastor to so on and so forth. And usually we like titles because that designates our importance and it tells who we are and what we do. To say elder or deacon to those within uh, the fellowship of the churches of Christ that I belong to conjures up ideas of servanthood and leadership. But not to everyone. So what comes to your mind when you say Christian? As Moses was instructed by God to build the tabernacle, which was a physical structure that was intended to be a place where his glory would dwell, his original plan and purpose was to dwell in them. Exodus 28 and verse 8, correctly interpreted, can be read, let them make a physical structure. But I'm going to have my dwelling place in them. From that time on, all the spiritual leaders and prophets of God are crying out against the abuses of this theological institution, the religious system, today we call the church. In and of itself, there wasn't one spiritual thing that was spiritual about the tabernacle. Nothing. There was nothing spiritual about the altar of incense. There was nothing spiritual about the labor of brass. There was nothing spiritual about the Holy of Holies. And there really was nothing spiritual about the Ark of the Covenant. Because you see, the temple was designated to point the spiritual to the spiritual. Religion, if in its heavenly truths attired, needs only to be seen to be admired, says the poet Copter. Well, that's true. The same thing is evident today. Magnificent edifices, many times raised to somebody's monumental ego, are raised in supposed honor of God. But usually it only raises up one particular creed or doctrine above others. Spiritual leaders today still ring out about the abuses of theological institutions and religious systems. But why? Is it because eyes are turned more upon them and the maintenance of them than upon God and his plan for his creation? Cotton wrote, men will write for religion, fight for it, die for it, anything, but live for it. 
Scripture makes plain that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit that dwells within you. That's really our identity today, but what does that mean? I mean, we hear phrases like that popped around all the time. But what does it mean to be the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit? And what's the implication from it? So let's go back to our text. In John chapter 2, it's Passover. Jesus is in Jerusalem at the temple. We notice in Greek something very interesting as we come to verse 13. It's springtime. And in verse 14, the word temple, which is Strong's Concordance number 2411, and if you go to Thayer's Greek English Lexicon, page 299, here's what you're going to read. The word temple is herion, a word that designated the whole compass of the sacred enclosure, embracing the entire aggregate of buildings, balconies, porticos, courts, meaning that of the men or the Israelites, that of the women, that of the priest, all that belonged to the temple. So when he says the temple, he's relating to the entire structure of the temple. And the Jewish leaders asked him after he had whipped people out and overturned money changers, you know, tables and that type of thing, made a general mess of things. Who gave you the authority to act this way? What sign are you going to give us to show us that you have the authority to act this way? In verse 19, he uses the word naos, Strong's Concordance number 3485. In Thayer's Greek English lexicon, you'll find this definition on page 422. It's a word that only designated the sacred edifice itself, consisting of the holy place and the holy of holies. So he's not using the word temple. He walked into the temple. That's a different word than the word naos. In classical Greek, that's used of the sanctuary, the cell of a temple where the image of the God is placed. And when he talks about, you know, destroy this naos and in three days later, I'll raise it up. They're so confused about what he said that they don't understand this at all. They even take his own word, naos, and say it took 46 years to build it. It didn't take 46 years to build the naos. That's the inner grouping. Uh, the, the, the 46 years took the entire edifice to build. And in verse 41, he says, I speak of the naos or the sanctuary. He spoke of the naos or the sanctuary, which was his body. You see, literally, he was telling them, what you're looking at is, a, is an enclosure for God. And if God is enclosed here, and God dwells in me, then I am God in the flesh. You see, when God created Adam, or Adam, in his own damut, or likeness, he created him literally to be a God, as we looked at earlier. The first Adam. But when he sinned, that which had come unto him from God was lifted. Now Jesus appears on the scenes and says, Don't you know that my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? You destroy this naos, and this naos will raise up in three days. I am God in the flesh. God resides here. Remember what he said in John 10, verse 34, relative to our identity when he quoted Psalms 82 and verse 6? In Psalms 82 and verse 1, the implication is polytheism, many gods. But he's talking about who we are in the sight of God. Jesus understood this. And in John 10, they said, we want to know who you are. You see, they didn't understand not only their identity, they didn't understand his identity. And in verse 30 of John 10, he says, I and the Father are one. Are you paying attention? I am God in the flesh. Now, that's what they understood. And for that reason, they're going to stone him. Because in that day and time, that's blasphemy. Let me go to John chapter 10, verses 31 through 38, and I'm going to be reading now out of the Amplified Bible. Again, the Jews brought up stones to stone him. And Jesus said to them, My Father has enabled me to do many good deeds. I've shown many acts of mercy in your presence. For which of these do you want to stone me? And the Jews replied, We're not going to stone you for a good act, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, make yourself out to be God. And Jesus answered, is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods. And he's quoting Psalms 82 and verse 6. So men are called gods by the law. Men to whom God's message came in the scripture cannot be set aside or counseled or broken or annulled. If that is true, do you say to me, the one whom the Father consecrated and dedicated and set apart for himself and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God? 
If I'm not doing the works or performing the deeds of my Father, then do not believe me. Do not adhere to me. Do not trust in me. Do not rely on me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me nor have faith in me, at least believe the works and have faith in what I do, in order that you may know and understand clearly that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. I am one with him. You see, they still don't understand his identity. When he says, destroy this naos, and I'll raise it up in three days. In John 10, it's like, you don't get who, who, who I am? Do you not see God? Is this not the way God would behave if he was among you? If you don't want to believe me, believe because of the works. Now, those that did believe him became a body of believers. What did they understand about their identity? Well, for the first 30 years, we know that the church was centered in and around Judea. And that 99.9% .9 of all the believers were Jewish. The Jewish church knew the spiritual significance of their identity. Do you realize that in the New Testament, there's not one single epistle written to a Jewish church? Now, Hebrews is written to a community, but it's not written to a Jewish congregation. Why? Because they had 2,000 years of moral and spiritual tradition behind them of who God is, what he expects, lessons from disobedience, and lessons from obedience. We know that by A.D. 50, there are, probably were around 50,000 Jewish believers in the city of Jerusalem alone, according to Professor David Flusser. The day of Pentecost shows the maturity and understanding that they had. And the Gentiles didn't understand much of anything spiritual. Why? Because of their background. What did they have? They had paganism. That's it. So it's for that reason that Paul had to write them and instruct them in these matters. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 15 through 20, Paul stated, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then make the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? This is the New International Version, by the way. Never. Do you not know that he who, unite, who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have received from God, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Naos, the sanctuary. Your body will be a dwelling place, the naos of the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. You are the holy place. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. 1 Corinthians 6.17 and there Paul states the same thing that Moses said in Exodus 25 and verse 8. Let them make a sanctuary, but I will dwell among them, or I will dwell in them. See, God intended from the start that your body was to be a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would dwell within you. He didn't dwell in some kind of physical structure. He doesn't dwell in some church building. That's just a structure, just a physical structure for people to, to come together and unite in. But that's not who you are. Your body is the holy of holies to God. Because God dwells in your body if it's allowed to. So if that's true, what does that say about my identity? Well, once I understand that my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit that lives within me, and that I am the Holy of Holies of God, then all these other things that have so confused us about our identity becomes unimportant and really highly insignificant. It means it doesn't matter if I have a big nose, if I'm fat, if I'm thin, you know, what color I am, it doesn't matter. Those are all externals. And if God decides to live in some little rat trap in the prairie, then that's his business. My business is to give him glory and honor in the body that he's given me and that I have decided I'm going to let him dwell in. There's a song that I learned some years ago, 
and uh, usually don't sing on uh, lectures, but I think this song warrants it. And it goes like this. Know ye not, know ye not, I'm the temple. Know ye not, know ye not, I'm the temple. Know ye not, know ye not, I'm the temple. I'm the temple of the Holy Ghost. Filled with praise, filled with power, filled with glory. Filled with praise, filled with power, filled with glory. Filled with praise, filled with power, filled with glory. I'm the temple of the Holy Ghost. That's the point. Paul wrote to the Thessalonian brethren in 1 Thessalonians 5 in verse 23. May the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through. That is, separate you from profane, profane things. Make you pure and wholly consecrated to God. May your spirit and soul and body be preserved sound and complete and found blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. To preserve to guard, to keep you just like you'd station a, a, um, a guard over a treasure. And you would command him at the cost of his life to keep that particular treasure. Blameless. That's the same word that's used for the Lamb of God, the Lamb of sacrifice without spot or blameless. Body, soul, spirit. There isn't anything else. That's all we're composed of. If our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and if Christ is dwelling in us, then that means there isn't room for anything else. Praise the Lord, O my soul. This is from the Amplified Bible, Psalms 103, verses 1 through 5. All my inmost being praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget all its benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. You see, every fiber, every tissue within your body was designed to operate and function in harmony with God's will because that's why we were created. And if we can understand that and lay hold on who it is that we are and we can understand what God wants of us, then I believe we could have the greatest service of our lives every, every week that we came together. Imagine an explosion of understanding we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. When we are combined, we're there to energize and to encourage one another. Imagine if we knew what God wants of us and every single person understood the role that they were to play in the body of Christ. How exciting that would be. If the Lord's Supper could become our focal point for coming together, the movement of Jesus among us to fill up our every need would be accomplished and the movement of the Spirit might begin. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? He is in us. We're not just flesh. We're not just bone. We're not just walking around without a clue. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if that's true, and if God lives in us, His authority is our authority. His capacity is our capacity. Not because we're so great, but because He is in us and we are a part of Him. Do you understand who you are? You are the temple of the Holy Spirit that lives and dwells within you. You are the body of Christ. Your body is the holy of holies of God. It's the only place where the glory and the presence of God dwells on this earth. And if that is the truth, then that ought to be a real occasion for praise, shouldn't it? That ought to move us to bless and praise God from the bottom of our feet to the top of our head. And to sing Psalms 103 maybe this way. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name, for he hath done great things. For he hath done great things, for he hath done great things, bless his holy name. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
Allow God to be seen each and every day as you move out in that dimension by allowing God to create what he wants to create within you. Well, I appreciate your kind attention. And I appreciate you listening to the four lectures on this concept of God and what uh, he is within you and who he is within you. And I hope that you go to the scriptures and look up the uh, verses and the words that I gave you, the uh, concepts that uh, I alluded to from Strong's Concordance and from Thayer's Greek and English Lexicon, and that you won't rest, um, you know, your study just listening to me, but that you actually go and do it yourself. That's indeed what we want you to do at the California School of Theology. May God's blessings be with you, and I look forward to hearing from you soon. Take care.